Let us pray. O God, by the passion of your blessed Son, you made an instrument of shameful death to be for us the means of life. Grant us so to glory in the cross of Christ that we may gladly suffer shame and loss for the sake of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. Friends, 364 days out of the year, the central symbol of our Christian faith, which is the cross, is a pretty easy object for us to take in and deal with. 99% of the time, the cross is just that, a symbol of our faith. We wear it on necklaces, bracelets, and jewelry. We might stick a cross on our car window or hang it on our rearview mirror. We place them on the walls of our homes, in our offices, and even in our bedrooms. Who knows? You might even get a cross tattooed somewhere on your body. We Christians take our faith seriously, and we aren't ever afraid to let people know about it. And the majority of the time, whether we're Episcopalians, Methodists, Baptists, Roman Catholics, Greek Orthodox, or Pentecostal, we let people know we are Christians by using the signs and symbols of the cross. But on this day, Good Friday, if we listen closely again to the passion story of Jesus Christ as told in the Gospel of John tonight, we might just feel like we're being smacked in the face when we hear again just exactly where the cross comes from and what it represented 2,000 years ago in the ancient world. For in the passion story of Jesus, the cross represents again one thing, and one thing only. The ancient Roman Empire's most shameful and excruciating form of execution of criminals and political prisoners, crucifixion. The cross becomes again what it always has been, a heavy wooden instrument of utter pain and of torture, which leads to just one thing, death. When we consider again just exactly what the cross means for Jesus of Nazareth and for thousands of others at the time of the Roman occupation of Judea, it is no wonder that for some Christians, the cross has become a symbol they would just as soon avoid. Certainly in this early part of the 21st century, when just about the only thing we don't want to talk about in polite company is death and dying, why in the world would anyone ever want to wear something around their necks that symbolizes that very thing, death, much less tattoo it on a body or hang it on a wall in your living room? Yet as much as our Western culture pushes us one step more and more away from that one thing that our science, technology, and medicine can't seem to get us out of, the church continues to hold it up in front of everyone and everywhere. And our Christian story, no matter what happens in the world out there, continues to be tied intricately and essentially to the story we just heard of a man who died a terrible death upon the very same instrument of execution we wear today, a cross. So the question for this day must always be, why is it that we Christians continue to do this? Why do we continue to hold up the cross? It seems that even the church itself today has fallen a bit into the sway of culture in our own funeral practices. When we no longer call our funeral liturgy what it's called in the prayer book, which is burial of the dead, but instead we call it a celebration of life. If we want to avoid talking about death and celebrate life, why does it appear that we Christians remained so focused on death on this Friday, which we have never called a sad Friday or a painful Friday or a bad Friday, but instead we call the Friday of the Lord's death and passion Good Friday. Why do we still need this story? And why in the world do we still need the cross? As strange as it may sound as a Christian priest and pastor, I have found that asking myself 
those important questions every day has become very, very essential in my exercise of personal faith. A few weeks back as we were heading into the final weeks of Lent, about 40 or so of us gathered here at St. Thomas in the parish hall on a Saturday morning for a workshop on that very topic we'd rather not talk much about, death and dying. For most who signed up, I'm sure you planned on spending most of the time going over funeral planning and talking a little bit about what you should do to prepare for your final arrangements. That's certainly what I think we spent a good amount of our time doing, but I felt compelled to begin our workshop together by telling everyone a bit of my own story with dealing with this very topic, death and dying as a Christian priest, and why that story has changed my life my life and my views on what the church must start doing more of in our very death-avoiding culture. For me, that story began with my ordination. As much as we priests look forward to liturgies and prayer services, Sunday school classes and visits to people who are sick, as much as we dream about those wonderful parish cookouts and baptizing cute little chubby babies, what we find out quite quickly is that the one thing we would do more than anything else as priests is funerals. And if you stay in a parish long enough, the funerals we find ourselves doing become not just for the homebound who we have very little chance of getting to know, but it becomes for friends who we have began to love. Death for a priest can get very personal very fast. And unlike losing our loved ones and friends over time as we get older, in the church we clergy lose dear family members at a much, much faster pace, sometimes overwhelmingly fast. I was ordained just a few weeks before I turned 33, still young enough to have had very few direct encounters with death before my ordination. I'd lost my great-grandparents when I was in my teens, and I'd lost a great uncle who I was somewhat close to while I was in college, but I was not prepared for how close I was about to come after my ordination to death on a regular basis and to the death and dying of people I'd come to care about. And even though I knew the Christian theology of death and the promises of eternal life and resurrection, over these last 15 years, I found myself in many a moment being overcome with despair, overwhelming sadness, and serious anxiety. And there have certainly been more than a few moments when I wasn't sure I could continue on. Yet it was in those kinds of moments that I suddenly found myself reaching for really the only thing I could reach for, the cross. I carry in my pocket everywhere I go a little olive wood rosary that I purchased nearly 20 years ago in Jerusalem. And in moments of fear and despair, I still keep it in my pocket and I reach in and let my fingers trace the, the wood of the cross at the end of this rosary. There have been some moments when I just needed to reach down and know that it was there for me. And there have been others when I have found myself holding on to this little cross so tightly I'm quite sure that my fingers turned white. It's in all these moments when I truly came to know and understand what the cross really means for those of us who struggle in this very confusing world to place our faith and trust in God, to put our faith and life in the hands of Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. As I found myself holding on to this cross in many a hospital room with a grieving family, I've never failed to be able to look up and almost see Jesus nailed on the cross, looking down on all of us, breathing his own last breath with the dying person. And when I have stood in a funeral home for a visitation, I have held on to this cross and been able to see Jesus' own blessed mother weeping for the loss of her son with those gathered around the coffin and those disciples seeming to be standing nearby in the same fear and dismay at the death of their own dear friend and teacher. And finally, when I have walked into the church for the burial of the dead 
as I've held on to the cross, I've envisioned those three women who loved Jesus so much, Mary Magdalene, Mary the wife of Clopas and Salome, who arrive at the tomb on the third day to anoint and clean the body of Jesus for the last time, only to find that tomb empty. I let the story of the passion of Jesus continue to run through my mind always because it helps me every day to realize that this cross is not at all about sadness, but rather it is our greatest hope in that one thing which we face, which is death. It is hope because we know through the cross that Jesus himself has been there with us in every moment of despair and with the loss that we've had of those we love. He has walked through death himself and through the cross he has set into motion death's own demise. And that is true hope in a world suffering from pain and violence and senseless death, no matter how hard we try our best to look away and to hide our eyes. And we believe God walked through it and took death upon himself because of deep, incredible love for us. God's love set out from the beginning to destroy death once and for all and to set us free from the fear and pain of sin and death that have haunted us from the moment of Adam and Eve's fall in the Garden of Eden. As Jesus would tell his own beloved friends on the night before he will enter into a new garden, no one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. And that's why Jesus does it all because we are his friends and he loved us so much from the beginning that he wanted to touch all the pain and the suffering that we must touch so that we know he understands it. We know that he stands with us through it and just as the death of the cross will be overturned for Jesus with the resurrection on Easter morning, God will overturn all of it, death included, for us who believe as well. Through the love and sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, death no longer has dominion over us. Meditating on that promise daily, brothers and sisters, has transformed me, and I'll be honest with you, it has saved me. And because of that, the cross is no longer that old instrument of death. It has now become a promise of eternal life. It is hope that runs eternal. It is the sacrifice made to take away the sting of death, which otherwise threatens us always. I want to leave you with a quote that has been inspiring to me as I've gone through this Good Friday. It's a quote from Cardinal Raniero Catalamessa, preacher for the papal household for the last three Catholic popes. He says this on Good Friday about the glory of the cross. What does the Christian faith say about death? The message is direct and uncomplicated. Death exists. It is the most serious of our problems, and Christ has defeated it. A very decisive human event, event took place with the result that human death is no longer the same. In faith, we are given this incredible news that only the coming of God himself on earth could accomplish. Like a serpent whose poison can only anesthetize its victim for a short time but cannot kill him, death has lost its sting. As St. Paul says in his first letter to the church in Corinth, death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? We adore you, O oh Christ, and we bless you. Because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. Amen.